Welcome, everyone. Um, we'll give a few more participants uh, the opportunity to join us. In the meantime, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, for those of you who are a little less familiar with Zoom, um, do be aware that there are two comfort functions available to you. Uh, in the top right-hand corner, you should be able to have a little button that says View, and you can choose between a speaker view and a gallery view. Whichever is most comfortable to you, try them out um, and see which one you feel most comfortable with. Um, we should probably get started. I'll be reading some notes on one screen and speaking with the moderators um, and the panelists and, and all of you on this screen. So I'll be busy going back and forth. Um, I will start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Christoph, Christoph Engowski. I work um, at the British Council. Um, and um, I work in what is called the global network team. That means uh, we connect the organization's offices outside of the UK with um, the UK um, Foreign Ministry, the FCDO, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, and I specifically look after East Asia and the Americas. Before that, I ran the Creative Europe desk um, in the UK since 2010. And before that, I worked on European projects and research um, and uh, collaborative initiatives. Um, I speak a few languages, um, grew up in Brussels and um, quite enjoy the whole European ecosystem of arts, culture and her heritage, which is, I think, one of the reasons I've been um, put into the position today. So hello, everyone. Um, we are here for um, The Art of Departing. This is one of eight modules. And this module, the only English speaking module, is um, in two parts. So we have um, available to you and what has been available for the last uh, couple of weeks are uh, speed dating videos, which are on the um, website for the conference, which should probably pop up in the chat. Um, at some stage. Um, this speed dating format was really interesting. It um, gave, gives insights from the sector um, through six different people who um, were on sort of blind dates in a way because they didn't really know each other. They came from different sectors, uh, different types of organizations, different countries, um, and were asked to talk about what their crises were. Um, so you can go back after this um, and have a look at what they were uh, talking about, what the conversation was about. Um, and uh, the next part of this module is here today. This is the panel discussion. And uh, the panel discussion um, and everything uh, together with this module has been put together by uh, the three organizers, the European Compendium, the contact points for Creative Europe um, in Germany and the contact point for uh, Europe for Citizens and the Association for Cultural Policy, the Kulturpolitische Gesellschaft. Um, I will introduce um, very briefly that we have a panel, but the panelists will introduce themselves. So um, could I go over to um, uh, Elsa, uh, Isabel, and Milena, um, in that order, uh, to introduce yourselves briefly, please. Elsa. Thank you, Christoph, and thank you very much for having me here. My name is uh, Elsa Christensen Rejepovic, um, and to most of you, probably will be much easier to just remember Elsa. Uh, everything else is way too difficult. Uh, I'm an independent consultant in the field of international cultural relations and I engage in different European projects and uh, actions, such as uh, Voices of Culture, the European project for enabling dialogue with the cultural sector in the EU. Some of you have probably heard of it before. Maybe some of you even taken part in it. Apart from my consultancy and project management engagements, I uh, also am a member of the um, European Capital of Culture Selection and Monitoring uh, expert panel nominated by the European Parliament. And I'm a working nomad um, 
currently based in Denmark. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Isabel, Isabel Schwarz, and I'm sitting now in Germany, but uh, usually I'm in Amsterdam working for the European Culture Foundation, in short, ECF, when I'm responsible for its advocacy department, so head of public policy. And um, I'm French and German, Isabel, the French, Schwarz, the German connection. My background um, is also hybrid in a way it combines uh, cultural policy and uh, cultural history and art history. And I have been working um, within either intergovernmental organization or national organization like the Ministry of Culture in France, but also very small NGOs and European networks and two different foundations. And I find um, the foundations world probably the most adequate to me because you're pretty independent and agile compared to the big inter international institutional organizations. Thank you. Uh, my name is Milena Dragicevic Sesic, and as Elsa said, that's too complicated also. So Milena would be enough. I am Professor Emerita at the University of Arts in Belgrade. It sounds very nice, but in reality, it basically means that I have retired. But I have not retired my work as uh, neither teaching, neither research, neither consulting, working for UNESCO as technical facility expert or for European Cultural Foundation in Belarus, for example, and in Turkey and many other regions of the world from Europe through Central Asia till India, Cambodia and Thailand. But uh, let's say domestically, uh, I am also civil society activist, and that is something that I see as a very important uh, duty or a responsibility of one researcher or scholar. Welcome, and thank you um, for joining us, all three of you. So. Um, the, the panelists have also been chosen because they represent a broad, uh, broader spectrum of uh, the uh, cultural and creative sectors um, across Europe, represent different types of organizations and different structures as well. Um, and um, I also uh, have just been told by um, my earpiece that the, um, from the speed dating, um, we also have three other participants. So we have Olga Goranka, and uh, Maria with us um, as well, um, and uh, we'll probably be able to hear from them directly and live as well. Olga, who um, works with the City of Literature Foundation in Poland, Maria, Maria Vlachu, um, from Accesso Cultura in Portugal, um, who I know from one of their European projects, um, and uh, Goranka Horjan from the Ethnographic Museum in uh, Zagreb in Croatia. So um, welcome to you guys as well. Um, so what we'll go on to next um, is a trailer uh, that cuts together. It's really, really smooth. Um, it cuts together um, some moments um, from the um, speed dating videos. Um, they, uh, as I said, took place um, as part of the what is your crisis and how do we deal with it uh, kinds of questions. These recorded videos were um, speed dates and blind dates um, and should give a really nice introduction to the discussion um, in terms of the challenges and the crises faced um, by European cultural institutions, um, organizations, um, and um, we'll move into the trailer right now. Okay. Uh, about the times we're therapy. living in. Yeah, very nice. Um, also do you want to tell me about where you are? To different tools yes, that help out. us meet the crisis. Yeah, I will. What we have been discussing uh, among uh, professionals is this uh, concept of systemic crisis. And uh, somehow in our museum sector, uh, we think that uh, this crisis actually uh, started long before the pandemics hit. And uh, we have not been prepared to this crisis. Uh, we have not been trained to build resilience. 
And uh, the sector was not only unprepared, but it was constantly operating on the verge of uh, financial stability. But what you described, those, the freelancers, the, the, the micro organizations, the small organizations that are not crown jewels, um, we need to not only support them to survive, but uh, they need to be um, really operational because there's work to be done. What is the mission of culture organizations? Because we tend to consider that our mission is a, a, des um, a description of what we do and not why we do it. The other problem I can see also is like uh, 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 that the culture uh, had gained uh, more uh, instrumental value instead of this intrinsic value it has it itself. It's the question of the relevance of art, relevance mm -hmm. of culture. And if we know when we become aware of certain things, certain mega trends, certain local trends, uh, if that helps us ma making art, what we do more relevant. I have the feeling that there are so many um, crises. Do you say that crises? What's the yeah, crises. <laughs> crises <laughs> at the moment in parallel. I mean, the political um, shift to the right and fragmentation, uh, COVID. Um, then the, the, the global reshuffling of powers at the moment, the ecologic crisis, uh, and then the whole identity, um, uh, identity discussion, which is somehow also fragmenting even us on the progressive spectrum. You now we're trying now to put a big focus on uh, cultural leadership. Um, we feel that, you know, in our cultural organizations, we have many directors but very few leaders. So in any type of crisis, be it uh, social, political, economic, or health crisis as we're dealing with now, uh, it's really difficult to find, uh, to find out who is going to speak for the sector yeah. and who with. So rather than having a kind of uh, a, a clear plan, uh, it's more about sort of um, saying, well, actually we're going to conduct a number of experiments and we're going to test some hypotheses and then we're going to see what the result is of those experiments and then mm -hmm. that will inform our process going forward and that's been quite freeing in a way because um because we're kind of succumbing to that you know that process and so there's room for risk which is so important and room for mm -hmm. failure which as we know is like critical yeah. to the creative process I like to think about uh, uh, about the future of culture sector as it emerges. Like, mm. uh, so I think that our uh, flexibility and adaptability that somehow defines the culture sector. It's mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not uh, written in stone. It has to, and it always has adapted to changing uh, environment. I think that this is the real strength and resource uh, that uh, that will uh, help us uh, through different types of crises and uh, and uh, get to a place where we can have a more relevant All right, there we have it. Um, so the um, the trailer in a way connects these two formats of the module, the, the speed dating video talks um, and the cut that you just saw gives the various voices from these um, different cultural institutions a chance to speak. Um, and um, it asks, what is their crises? So now we're moving into um, a conversation with our panelists asking, um, what is our crisis? So we're moving from, from, the, from the us to the we um, and uh, asking the question um, much more broadly. How can we look at the crises and the challenge of the cultural sectors at the moment from a European perspective, what commonalities are there and uh, what solutions um, can there be? Um, so what, where we'd like to be today at the end of today's session is um, with some action points, with a little bit of a broader understanding um, of uh, where the different we's um, are coming from. Um, and not necessarily only have a nice uh, set of conversations, but also some, I think, 
fairly clear ideas of what kind of solutions um, would be workable and that we'd like to go on um, exploring a little bit further. So I'll ask um, the panelists for a few reflections. What is it um, that you found particularly compelling when you were watching um, the speed dating videos? Um, what do you, what, what is your impression of the trailer? Do you agree with um, the types of crises? Do we have one all-encompassing crisis? Are there different ones? Um, and I'm going over to you, the panelists now for some thoughts on that. Um, would you like to go first, Isabel? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I think all of the points that have been actually made in the trailer are very, very relevant, and I can really echo um, all of them, uh, both in terms of uh, representation, who's, who talks, who is at the table, who is part of the conversation, um, issues of inclusivity, um, of fragmentation, polarization, and the role of culture of it. And I think something important in this context, two things I, I would maybe highlight, is uh, one that indeed what the crisis has done has brought to the light fragilities, vulnerabilities that were there for a long time. And um, so far we all have kind of muddled through the process and thought, well, somehow we're gonna solve it. It, 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 it will work that way. Also because um, it might be a bit provocative, but if we look at the last, um, the last decades, these have been kind of the fat years uh, in terms of cultural provision, and uh, not in all countries in, in Europe, but um, some of the Western European countries, for example, I mean, in terms of uh, support, uh, investment, and so forth in culture, um, I think we have been, in some case, pretty privileged compared to other countries in other, in other regions of the world. But what we have... Um, what we have not gained yet, and I think that is really the, the, the red thread throughout the conversation of today, is to get collective impact in terms of the recognition of culture beyond its possible economic contribution, uh, beyond GDP, beyond uh, uh, issues of employment. You, what, what I witness, for example, is that you know, when Ernest and Young publishes a report with data on the recovery for culture and creative industries, it has been looked at and politicians picked it up. But why do we as the culture sector, uh, you know, having been engaged so long in advocacy and other uh, in, and, 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 and uh, nationally, locally, and also on, on European level, we don't have that yet strong, unified, impactful voice. Um, so I would say what, COVID-19 has, COVID has done is has sort of deepened, I think, the, the political, the economic, the social, and the, the cultural vulnerabilities um, of Europe, and that the beliefs that we had previously, beliefs that, you know, that the market will solve all challenges, uh, that is totally obsolete. And, um, and it also has become evident that it's, it's impossible to revert to the old normal because the old normal was actually part of the problem. And the pandemic, I think that is also what comes out in, these, uh, in, this, uh, in the trailer is that um, these vulnerability are now really tangible to everyone. And they are experienced by a massively increased number of uh, creatives and individuals across the world. Um, so what is what I see as an opportunity in the in the crisis is that it's actually it 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 forces us to change fundamentally course. It's a wake up call, and it also F offers I would say agency uh, for change. And then regarding the question of um, do we see it only as, as one crisis or several crises, I think we have now several interconnected crises and that, that they are all entangled with each other and that makes the situation so complex. Um, and because of this interconnectedness, also the solutions, they, con they can only become reality by connecting through uh, with others outside of the culture sector. So um, looking beyond our own bubble 
and indeed we come we will probably come to this and i also see this in the trailer is how do, are we able to uh, leave all practices behind be inspired also by other uh, sectors and other uh, policy areas practices and also how do we make our own practices valuable to others um that's what I would probably say now. Maybe one more last thing is about the um, the notion of a poly crisis. Also, you know, we have actually been um, challenged by all kinds of crises, one after the other. I mean, from the financial crisis, uh, the migration crisis, the poly, the uh, migration crisis. Um, uh, populism and now the pandemic and I think what is also comes out in the trailer is that uh, while we are managing the pandemic and while we are managing to survive in that pandemic we also have to reinvent how to build the future and I think that's very very hard it's really difficult to get these two um, uh, these these two very important acts um, um together yeah that's what i would say i think from the beginning yeah thank you isabel um some really good uh, thoughts to get us started with um could i come to you um Bilena, next um i'm sorry i should have given you a little bit more warning to tell you uh, which which order um what what would you like to leave behind milena but uh, regarding what was said, many things uh, was said, especially in this speed dating, and there are many, many speakers raised so many different issues that I would like to underline only few. So no one to be offended because really everyone said very many interesting uh, things. But to say what, uh, Isabel first was saying it's a multiple uh, crisis on all possible levels from economic to political to ecological to as Lars said identity crisis and so on. When we take all that in account it's in fact we have to realize that we are living in a world where culture in this moment is not important. And that's something that it's left at the periphery or all areas of debate. It can be seen in any news. In a normal news, you do not see any more cultural rubric, as we used to call it in former Yugoslavia, which was obligatory before sport. Now, sport is in the news, but not culture. Culture has its own news after midnight for those that survive. So what I want to say, we uh, entered in the pandemic globally, all our crises are global, and that is something that I would like that we debate today, although I'm excusing to Ulrike and to you, Christoph, I know that is supposed to be European panel, but I don't think we have to look only inside Europe, because everything uh, is affecting us. We cannot speak about pandemics in Europe today, having with us someone from India ignoring what a catastrophe is there. Same with migration, same with political crisis. It's on our edges. Coming from semi-periphery of Europe, uh, I'm very semi-periphery of the world maybe and so on. I'm very aware that uh, what is happening in Turkey today, for example, the fact that our colleague is still three years in a prison, that European Cultural Foundation, by the way, is really lobbying, but that's the only cultural organization in Europe that is lobbying for Osman Kavala freedom. How many artists are detained, uh, imprisoned in uh, Belarus, for example? That is even not discussed and made public, although only yesterday we received a piece, a letter for the theater association in uh, Belarus saying that 
103 theater workers has been dismissed and more than 30 has been imprisoned, et cetera, et cetera. 10 had to flee the country. That these are crises that we cannot say they do not concern us. That is something that I would like to raise as a responsibility of the European or the world, however you call it, European, maybe because we are more lucky than many others in the world uh, sector, to raise the voice for those that are not heard. And it's not pandemics that silenced their voices. Uh, it's a illiberal political system, authoritarian political system, total lack of democracy from India to Brazil. Populism is uh, already, I would say, not, uh, uh, not saying much, but when we see the uh, how autonomy of cultural sector, how authority, I might agree that we lack of leadership, but this lack of leadership is just the consequence of the lack of autonomy of cultural sector. The fact that it's such a heavy political influence on nominating leaders of cultural institutions that then those nominated are not really free. And plus, they are not ready to share leadership with experts, with their teams, with the collectives and so on. And that is something that uh, really Corona pandemic illuminated that more resilient are more rich. The national cultural institutions, they've been more resilient, more successful to go through crisis because they used to have rich digital funds of their former production, of their memories, and so on. NGOs that are hardly surviving uh, in the normal times, just doing project by project, rushing from project to project, they don't have time to digitalize their own productions, to keep their memory archived. And then they found themselves in impossible position during pandemics. So the gap in between rich and poor social injustice is uh, now very visible, even in cultural field, where it was not that, uh, um, I will say, it's not like that, like in some other areas of the world. So I have to say that uh, many evils of contemporary world, we have to consider as a present crisis to which cultural policies had not yet found the solution, such as even racism, uh, not to speak about uh, wars that are happening all around. Apartheid in many of the countries with whom we are culturally collaborating. Uh, all these evils that are entering in cultural sector through neoliberal capitalism, such as competitivity, seeing creative industries or commercialism in a culture as a panacea. But on the other side, corruption, lack of social justice, and so on, that's all present, not only in the political and social system, it's also reflected in a, in a cultural system. And that is something that we should speak more about ethics of cultural policy and cultural management nationally, but also internationally in the future, because only united in synergy, we might have uh, contribute to some changes in cultural field, in cultural systems. Milena, thank you. Um, we'll move to our next um, panelist, Elsa, are you? Are you still with us? Yes, Hi. I'm still with you. Hi. Thank you very much. And uh, what a task to come after two such uh, very, very uh, comprehensive contributions from my two colleagues. Um, yes, crisis, but I'm also provocatively thinking if maybe this is an opportunity, there's no doubt that there are a lot of challenges 
that have actually, most of them, been there for a long time. Um, but we've been in a, in a state of sleeping beauty for years and years uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sector. And the coronavirus has been like a shell shock um, that has uh, rocked us all uh, into thinking that now suddenly we have um, this huge immediate crisis. Um, I have a lot of respect for, um, for what's just been said, um, and it's all true, and it's also all very true what the um, people in the speed dating have been saying. Um, but there is, um, there is also a, um, a problem of trying to find a one-size-fits-all. Um, this sector is so uh, diverse, it's so fragmented, we're talking about so many different things, um, and I don't really see how it's going to be possible to, um, to come to a solution. Um, I think we have to, first of all, have a mindset change. We need to look at our, um, at our sector not as a victim, not as um, a sector that needs to be helped, uh, carried, uh, but maybe uh, referring to what Isabel said, uh, the moment um, the cultural sector became an, a point on the agenda through the Ernst & Young report, um, suddenly people started um, uh, listening up. Um, so what can we learn from other sectors uh, than our own sector? Uh, how do we manage in our sector to get from being down prioritized? And as Melina says, you know, culture is not important. It's not viewed as being important. Uh, there are all the other things that are so much more important. Um, but what's brought about that mind change that culture is not important uh, and should we not look at ourselves to finding the solutions should we not look at ourselves to perhaps um, go into the trouble of explaining to the people who do not necessarily understand what this is about who look at culture as something elitist um, and so rather than rolling our eyes when the taxi driver or the shop assistant or the person sweeping the street or clearing the dustbins does not understand uh, why you are lobbying for money for culture, um, but rather finding ways to explain it. Um, and so with Ernst and Young and the report came, uh, well, long before that even, um, an instrumentalization of, of culture. And then you could start putting a, a, a value on it. And for years and years and years, we heard um, uh, commissioners uh, um, referring to the Ernst and Young report and saying, you know, culture uh, produces value that is in excess of or in a, uh, you know, um, surpassing the car industry and the chemical industry and all of these uh, hard fact uh, numbers, but still no real argumentation that is, is necessarily understood uh, elsewhere. So it is, up to the, it is up to the sector to rethink, to try to be more proactive um, rather than uh, all the time lagging behind and being reactionary to the, the, the challenges and the changes and complaining and nagging about how difficult life is. I'm being provocative, but I think that it's, um, it's a, a forum where one can be a little bit provocative. Um, but to, to, um, to rather be, be more assertive and to learn, um, learn the tricks, the, the traits from, that we see from other sectors. Um, the first part of the, the discussion today should not be about solutions, but I would like to just um, mention uh, a sector that has been extremely successful at uh, making themselves or positioning themselves and getting big money, both, both nationally and um, on an EU level, namely the agricultural sector. So uh, they are also a very fragmented sector. You have the, the farmers uh, sitting around um, on European farms, on global farms, but they found a way back in the 19th century of organizing themselves. So perhaps we need to, um, 
to um, slow down with the um, with the moaning and groaning and the complaints and uh, uh, feeling disillusioned um, and then to rather find best practice ways to, to move ahead by looking at, at where did it work, where have people succeeded in, in working, uh, working it out for themselves. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if uh, in a decade or two culture could be moving up uh, on the agenda and not be the, um, as an example, the commissioner post that is the least attractive um, and the, the, also the, the, the minister post in any national country that is the least attractive uh, to, to be awarded uh, to a, a title that, uh, or a position that is really looked at with uh, respect uh, without all of us all the time having to start explaining whenever we go anywhere, why is culture important? Thank you, Alison. Um, again, lots of, lots of notes um, that I've been taking. I'll also um, go to all of our participants. Please um, use the chat function. Um, if you have any questions, any comments, please add them uh, into the chat function and um, we'll pick those up uh, a little bit later in the next um, part where we'll be bringing you a little bit more in. But if you have any comments or questions that, that can't wait, um, please put them into the chat or write them down and we'll bring you in uh, a little bit later. Um, you'll have the opportunity of raising your hand and you'll be given the proverbial microphone um, by our technical moderators uh, later on. Um, I have a few questions for um, our panel members. Um, obviously, one of the things that we talk about a lot and that, that our um, colleagues in the speed dating uh, videos talked um, about a lot are the realities of where they are. Are we in our homes? Are we away from our work? Are we away from our audiences? Uh, what is it uh, that's, that's new or, or very different or particularly perturbing about where we are now? Um, one of the um, speakers at one of the earlier sessions um, as part of this conference uh, was talking about the corona crisis, about the pandemic, um, as giving us an opportunity to examine where we are in terms of cultural and creative sectors in a, in a bigger moment in time. Um, and he compared it to a kind of a stop motion film where um, we are in a kind of a stopped sequence. Um, and um, they suggested that this was a particularly interesting time to take the stopped moment and to dissect, to, to analyze more closely with possibly a little bit more time where we are, how we do things, how things hang together um, in the sectors. Um, is this something that you've been able to do um, individually as um, professionals? Is this something that you as organizations feel you've been able to do is to take this time and rethink and look at where we are, where you are? And do you think you're in the, the place that you want to be? Um, and I'll also come back to Elsa's comment about uh, mindset change. Has this given you, um, your friends, colleagues, members, the opportunity for a mindset change? I'm not going to pick on anyone in particular this time. I can start immediately Please because do, universities, they haven't had time to stop, to think. They had even uh, a task to go very quickly and to continue to readapt and so on. So there was no possibility. But very often that was the case in cultural sector for different reasons. Uh, for small NGOs and so on, it was also not a moment to stop because when they stop, there is no resources, there is no possibility to survive. So we saw a huge engagement of cultural organizations with the start of the pandemic. And I have to say that at the 
beginning, first month of the pandemic, it was who was in the first ranks of the, let's say, giving people morale, musician on balconies, making a symphony all together from their homes, uh, uh, drama artists trying virtual theater performances, the uh, home making po poetess and the poets reciting from their homes and so on. Many festivals went. We had in the first day of pandemics at my uh, Faculty of Dramatic Arts, we were supposed to have Festival of International Student Theater, first March. So it went virtually and it went perfect with the live streaming from Poland, from Polish Academy and so on. So it was really, uh, that's the reason I say that was only a few lucky ones. Maybe big public cultural institutions, they got a luxury to have a possibility to really deeply rethink their existence. Although I'm not sure in the case of the Balkans that they really did it, but because they also wanting to prove their usefulness. And when Goranka said that instrumentalization of culture, yes, pandemics was even underlying the need for instrumentalization of culture. Everyone expected culture to give support for the people that were especially during lockdown and so on. So uh, I would think that it would be after pandemics that the cultural sector should have some kind of sabbatical year to rethink because they are really producing. I can tell you, for example, Belgrade Drama Theater was never that productive as in this last season, including regional production. Probably it doesn't seem, when I say regional, it means with actors and actresses from Slovenia, Milena Zupancic, for example, is playing Macedonian theater director and so on. They did maximum they could, Yugoslav drama theater also. I mean, uh, looking at the museums, they had, they have such a fantastic production that now people are, um, I would say, uh, only in this moment in Belgrade, you have exhibitions which were not there before pand pandemics, okay? They've been imagined, for example, but now was a moment to, for the alternative curator and alternative artist from NGO sector, from Remont, to propose to Museum of Contemporary Art exhibition on one of top uh, Serbian, Yugoslavian alternative artist Fleka, and they gave a space. So it's a, now you have the exhibition of that artist in the the Museum of Contemporary Art and in this small NGO gallery, etc. So these are, and that is the reason that maybe I have to stop here, but I will just say that Elze has absolutely right, this intersectoral type of collaboration, uh, looking for ideas in other sectors, but also intersectoral collaboration that is coming in between public and civil society organization should in future restructure cultural system and making uh, uh, more, I would say, more the sector more interwoven, not so separated like that's public, public interest, public value, and that's civil society, that's activist, and that's probably is not that good or that uh, important. Thank you, Elsa. Go ahead. I saw a hand come up. I'd like yeah. to um, to continue on from uh, Milena um, and um, um, and um, just stress the importance of working across sectors, talking with people who don't think and do the way we do ourselves. And uh, uh, um, it was uh, wonderful to see the speed dating um, uh, videos. And uh, another experiment could be also uh, having speed datings with people from different sectors, but because lo and behold, there are so many 
similar uh, challenges and, and other crises out there in other sectors. And, um, and for sure, uh, there could be a lot of cross fertilization by talking to a farmer, <laughs> by talking to other sectors about the challenges that we have ourselves, but we tend to stay within our, our bubbles. And that's, uh, that's where we do our thinking. Um, on a personal level, it's been a relief um, uh, and a curse uh, to um, not be traveling, you know, 230 days in a year that I've uh, done many other years uh, and having to sit in front of my computer every day. Um, but it actually also has meant that I have reflected on the fact that we don't seem to um, to um, learn from the crisis. Um, that's very provocative to say, but, but it's as if we've just made our lives super busy by uh, logging on and taking part in this uh, conversation, the other, the third, we are everywhere all day long. Uh, we find ourselves uh, spending you know, 40, 60 hours in front of our uh, computer screens uh, every day, um, basically sh shifting, moving thoughts around. Um, we're not meeting, we're not getting the creative input from outside that uh, blasts us outside of our bubbles into new parts uh, of uh, thinking. And uh, as I see in the in the chat uh, from uh, Goranka, um, um, that, that we need to be aware very correctly, uh, uh, Goranka, as you're writing, that uh, a crisis uh, um, will change attitudes, um, values, our focus uh, has changed. And uh, it's not um, just a, a, a bracket, this corona crisis between the before and, uh, and uh, the future, but it's, uh, it's, it's different. Uh, it, well, it's maybe not necessarily that it is completely different now. It's just that the future has come a lot faster or maybe a lot clearer um, to us. And, and we are paddling behind. Um, and um, I really would like to see that, especially in this sector, that the artists and the creative minds uh, would uh, be standing up and being proactively uh, redesigning the future and not just waiting for the future to happen and then going uh, uh, running after it like running after a bus uh, wondering um, so then what do we do now that they have decided to the, to, to do this and that but no we did we designed the future um, ourselves um, and then again I need to get back to um, to these very serious um, issues that um, Milena also il illuminated in her introduction about the, the people who are prevented um, to express themselves um, and, uh, and racial discrimination, things that uh, are not, um, as another um, person also mentioned that, um, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about culture? Um, you know, is, is culture also um, dealing with these very serious uh, challenges? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a little um, confused in, uh, in basically taking the discussions uh, to be all, all over the place. And this is, I think, where our biggest challenges are. Thanks. Thanks, Elsa. Um, I suppose when I when I was asking about um, how people uh, and how colleagues have been taking the time, um, it, it sounds absolutely brilliant, Milena, when you're talking about some who have never been as busy. I, it sounded like that was a good kind of busy in terms of an innovating time type of busy, uh, moving conversations forward and collaborating type of busy, or has it been a kind of busy that's been more frantic and and maybe difficult and quite stressful. Um, I'm, I also know from, from sort of experience a little bit closer to where I live, there have been um, in the UK also quite a few individual sort of freelancers or artists who have seen their work dry up completely. Um, they have been out of work. They have not been able to perform in theaters. They have not been able to work uh, in galleries, um, hundreds, 
if not thousands of people who do front of house work um, in museums, in uh, world-class institutions who would normally visit, thousands of visitors a day are out of work and have been out of work for um, a long, long time and not always terribly well looked after. Um, there was a very ill-fated campaign by the UK government a while ago, uh, encouraging people to retrain, and to rethink their careers. And um, some of you might have seen that one of the images that they used um, was an image of a, of a dancer, um, a very sort of classical type of dancer. And it said something like, um, she's looking or she needs a new career. She just doesn't know it yet. I'm, I'm, I'm being provocative here and it's not quite what it was, but it was quite a difficult um, thing to see for many um, people in the arts and cultural sectors in terms of where, where they are, where they would like to be and where they feel their, their, their place is. Um, we were talking while we were preparing this panel about how the corona crisis might be a kind of a burning glass that might be, um, might, it, it's a very visual um, sense that I'll try to explain a little bit. I suppose it's about concentrating um, the number of crises that, that we've been facing and that you've all uh, named quite well, ones that we're not on our own. And if we talk about the arts, the cultural sector in terms of um, migration crisis, in terms of ecological crisis. Um, what is it that, um, <clears throat> are there any similarities in terms of the crises where we are finding um, more innovation or more collaboration, more awareness? Is there anything that, that, that we're learning um, from this stack and stacking of crises? Yeah, if you like, I, I, I also think that the want to highlight the point that Milena raised at the beginning about the international dimension. I think that is absolutely vital. Um, because also, for example, now something that is really hampering um, the cultural work is the issue of um, mobility, of course. Uh, and uh, the, the, the measures that are preventing us to be mobile. And I think we have a certain, I would say, a European approach to the notion of uh, green values, European values, and so forth. But they, this is a kind of a new neo-colonial way of looking away of how to do your cultural practice and, you know, what is your priority and what, is your, what are the resources for engaging actually with, uh, with others while some other parts of the world uh, have a very different understanding and a different approach to uh, mobility and, for example, would not necessarily only think about carbon footprint, uh, carbon uh, emission reductions, but there are many different other issues uh, at hand. So I think this is important to keep this in, in the conversation. But um, I also wanted to, um, to look at the crisis in, the, in sort of a wider uh, cultural context than the cultural sector itself. I really think that what we are witnesses here is a, a kind of the end of a system and, 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 and that we are urged to have some kind of new political and economic paradigm shift. And I usually hate that word paradigm shift because it has been really used and overused. But this is really, I think in that context today, really the most appropriate um, term. Um, and that the, the kind of liberal paradigm uh, that Milena was alluding to earlier, um, that has worked for some time, but is now fading away, but that this new paradigm and that kind of new narrative and the new strategies for that more substantial cultural change uh, is not there yet. So we see several elements of this. I mean, there's a lot of uh, research, for example, for example, done on, um, uh, on the commons and the culture as, as a common and commoning practices and bottom up approaches to cultural production, cultural dissemination and so forth. But I think we don't have the full picture. We, we still have this uh, puzzle that doesn't um, fit yet and uh, or is not giving the total picture that would actually make us move 
in a united and forceful um, way. So many still hold on to the past because the future is not known. And indeed it needs that risk taking and that experimental attitude um, uh, and, you, and you risk to fail. And I think there, and we will come maybe to this in the second part about solution, that funders uh, need to allow much more space for this experimentation, innovation, and invest in those. And then, um, and then uh, to see which of the former practices uh, have done their time and which of the new practices are very much worth investing in and sharing with, within different communities and within, um, within different um, uh, within different sectors and i also see um, um i also see that there is a maybe a, the silver lining i would say the silver lining in the in the crisis is indeed the opportunity for change um and that indeed as milena mentioned i mean culture you always think you're as a periphery you remember the old report uh, uh, culture in from the margins um and then what has changed since then? But what I think what has changed since then is that I see some of uh, political decisions makers on European level and on municipal level, on, the, on these both extreme, less on the national, that have actually more of a sense of the power of culture because of this interconnected, uh, because of this interconnected crisis, be it the social, be it the identity crisis, the migration crisis. And, um, uh, but they don't necessarily have the tools to actually work with culture or work with a sector that they are not uh, familiar with. And therefore, I think the opportunity lies indeed is to make the connection also from culture policy that is really data driven, evidence based that politicians need. But at the same time, you need that narrative, you need that emotional involvement and that tangibility that culture can bring in terms of uh, that change. I think just the figures or just the emotion will not work. And so is it also for the European project. We really need both. Um, Elsa, thank you. Um, you're making it very easy for me by putting your real hands up. Thank you very much to all. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll stick to that. Um, I'll just say, and it's, it's in the chat already, we'll be um, entertaining some thoughts from some of the panelists just a little bit longer, and then we'll be um, opening up the floor a little bit further. Please go ahead, Elsa. Yeah, it's just a very small uh, addition to what uh, Isabel very uh, rightly said about um, uh, a lot of the understanding of the value of, of culture being known at municipal level. And here I'd just like to to mention the many, many cities around uh, Europe who have been over the years candidating to, uh, to try to win the title of European Capital of Culture. Um, how uh, city after city uh, have, um, uh, well, first of all, to get the idea to even try to be a European Capital of Culture, um, to get the political support to even running and then to, to bit by bit understanding, realizing uh, in the communities um, the, the, the value of, um, of culture uh, for, for you know, unleashing that potential uh, at municipal level. Uh, um, many years ago, I was, I was running a candidacy myself in the um, border region between Denmark and Germany. And, um, it's, um, it's a periphery region. Um, people are not highly educated uh, in the region. Um, and um, despite of that, it was possible to convince the taxpayers to put aside an enormous amount of money to run a candidacy where there was absolutely no proof, um, no guarantee that uh, the city would win the title. Um, and it brought about a lot of uh, vibrance in the local community, people taking ownership um, of the candidacy uh, and, uh, and experimenting uh, with uh, cultural, uh, uh, cultural expressions. Um, and my neighbor asked me one day because they just closed the local school and she said, Elsa, excuse me, um, I think that uh, you're probably doing a wonderful job, but I'm really upset they are closing the local school. 
and then you know the municipality spending all this money on culture um and i was in a very easy way able to explain to her that if uh, the city doesn't or the municipality doesn't unleash this potential that culture is it's not just the school that will close then the the whole town will close because people will then keep uh, depopulating the area um, and it will be um, end up as as a retirement place only uh, if even that um, so two things both um, trusting actually that this is understood or not in every municipality but much more understood in municipalities the value of culture and also understanding that it is our obligation to be able to explain um, what culture can do um, to municipalities, to people. Milena, hi, thank you for, for both hands, the, the physical and the uh, yellow one. I would uh, like to add to this. I think that's really should be a, a complementary process that citizen has to be involved in bottom up participatory cultural democracy and uh, asking, creating, demanding, pressing their local governments on one side. On the other side, the bottom up cultural policy was partially created during this time of pandemics. And I was inspired by what you, Christoph, said about um, lack of production and then a lot of dancers, actors and so on are already more than a year without a job. It's partially responsibility of the public cultural system, but also of private producers and cultural managers. That's, uh, um, that problem exists generally, I mean, prior to pandemics, that cultural managers and producers uh, want to produce efficiently, productively, when they are sure that they are going to have audiences. Why they should produce anything during pandemics when it is forbidden to have audiences? But that means that they do not feel responsible for those people with whom they collaborate and they achieved a lot of money before pandemics. And I have many examples how small theaters, for example, in Shabbat's city theater, engaged all non-employed actors because employed actors, they continue receiving public salary, but they employed deliberately those that had used to have contracts with the theater, but then during pandemics, no contracts because there is no performances. So the director created even a project for a storytelling fairy tales that they could shoot from their own homes, paid them decently for the work they did. They created something. So it was not like collecting solidarity fund, which also our association of drama artists did. And all of us members of the association employed in public sector, having our regular salaries not diminished, we contributed to this solidarity fund for those that are not employed and are living on a, on a periodic contract. So this, but this is humiliating for one person to stay just on charity as it is humiliating to hear public uh, advice, um, learn something else, be, be something else, learn to cook. There is still a lot of need for catering, start producing catering and uh, deliver people uh, food at home and so on. So I think uh, that what we need now also is to develop a reflection on ethics of cultural work, specifically on responsibility and ethics of those who have power 
and those who have power are producers, managers, directors of institutions, directors, directors of film festivals, and so on. This was the moment when they should reflect whom to engage, how, uh, how to uh, show their responsibility to, toward all sector, not just, okay, let engage the best star and pay the star whatever, but let's engage people who are really artists that are good, that are excellent and that are in need. Um, there is also an example that I would like to share with, because it's coming from Africa. And usually from Africa, we have learned only about disasters. And when they are in media, it's mostly about uh, famine, about uh, whatever, ecological crisis, desert, mutual killings, and so on. But Festival sur le Niger in Segou in Mali is really a kind of a comprehensive model of city cultural policy. Because from that festival derived a lot of other activities, Segu Art uh, Biennial, Segu Art Fair, uh, Artisan Craft Fair, I, I can, uh, how it's a cultural center local because there is no public houses of culture. So they created uh centre culturel etc etc i could speak a lot i don't uh, want to take my time but that is the reason why i think we have to go beyond europe because real examples of uh solidarity activism and social responsibility because this cultural entrepreneurialism in africa is based on something they called Maya value, or it's in other region of Africa, it's not known as Ubuntu and so on. But that is that you don't do anything if you don't have agreement of a context. And if it is not for your context, it's not for the market, it's for the community. And that's the huge difference. Milena, you've uh totally pushed us over the edge, the, the good kind of edge. We're deeply in our next part where we're talking um, about the solutions and what we're going to do and how we do it. Um, I'd like to get back to what you were talking about um, in terms of the ethics um, of our work or the ethics of how we work. Um, one of the questions we had um, as part of the whole session today was, what is it that we need to transform? What kind of changes need to take place? And also, what do we want to give up? What do we have to give up? Um, what are we saying goodbye to? Um, you were talking about, we were all talking about sort of transferring a good practice, uh, sharing these good kinds of way, ways forward um, and learning from each other. Um, let's imagine that, that it's up to us, only up to us. Um, let's imagine that it's up to us as employers, as connectors, um, what are our responsibilities? Um, what Have we taken our responsibilities? Have we done the best that we could? And how could we do it even better? This is also opening it up to um, all of the um, participants today. Um, imagine it was up to us. Um, maybe a few uh, words from you, Isabel and Elsa, and then we'll throw it open to some of the participants. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to talk in the solution for the cultural deal, but I will I will put this just in the chat and then focus on, on, on something else and then people can look at it if they want, because that is all about uh, change and taking responsibility across sectors for a positive change and the recognition of culture in the in the broader um, global context. But maybe what I want to say um, now about this is um, that there is a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience indeed um, also in the sector, in our sector, and that we shape a community of practice that is extremely resourceful and, 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 and can be very inspirational. But, and that was also mentioned in the trailer, is also extremely fragmented and it's not well organized. Um, so the, uh, it, that, it's not a vis-a-vis -vis with a powerful voice like, for example, the agriculture sector on the environmental sector that we refer to. Of course, this has also um, 
um, um, there's also a um, cultural dimension to, to this. Um, but I think when we talk about what we need to leave uh, behind and change, I think it's also the notion of competition because so far we have been very much trained on, you know, if you compete, uh, you know, you, you have to compete, you have to be stronger, you have to, you know, to make the best business case. But actually what I mentioned earlier about the paradigm shift, it's really like how to move from the um, mantra of competition to cooperation and partnership also within the sector very much and across sector and across sector and across communities. And in, in this, what we should uh, do better, this is um, that advocacy part. Um, maybe we have to use some more sort of guerrilla tactics. You know, we do it quite nicely and bravely and it has been working in some things. I mean, it's like mea culpa too. This is also my, my own business. But, you know, we go through, through um, political channels that we infiltrate and we provide the knowledge and uh, we engage with the politicians. And, and I think we have uh, pretty fruitful conversations in some cases. But if we want that really radical change that now more and more people across the world want, we cannot just do it nicely and neatly, I think. Maybe we also need in parallel, not to give up, but we also need this kind of much more, yeah, uh, guerrilla-wise, um, strong messaging, strong actions. Because as I said, change will also only happen if we really engage people emotionally. And emotionally, this will not be just by drafting manifestos and writing open letters. This is also needed, but I don't think it's the... Um, it's the only way. So um, that would be my plea. And then when I mean across sectors, also um, in the solutions, um, I really think that philanthropy is part of uh, that call for partnership and that any of the solutions cannot be, um, cannot be successful if it's only government it cannot be just by civil society. It cannot be just by philanthropy. But now in that change, it's really like how we bring these different actors together and not only complement each other, but strategize together. And then decide on responsibilities that we all advocate together. In this case, the philanthropic sector, the private sector in some case, and the civic sector. I think there's still some room for improvement. Thanks, Christoph. Isabel, Elsa. Yeah, I will before we, uh, continue before we on, open up. I'll continue on from uh, from there, um, Isabel, um, about um, um, the necessity for cooperation rather than uh, than competing. There's uh, there's also a lot of jealousy in in the sector, um, and uh, and uh, it, it's not taking us anywhere good. Um, I just um, um, listened in to. Um, a di or a, a discussion on the on the Danish radio the other day uh, in connection with uh, Thomas uh, Winterberg um, winning all these uh, awards amongst others also Oscar for his uh, film um, uh, Another Round and the Danish film industry <laughs> in general um, experiencing uh, a lot of success in in these days and uh, so the question was how come. And uh, he was uh, exactly underlining uh, what you said, Isabel, that uh, he thought that one of the strengths um, that the Danish film industry is experiencing is that, uh, um, that the competition is, is not the way that they see it is in other countries, but more that you get together around a table, you, you know, uh, well, very fittingly have another round. <laughs> And uh, and just uh, and just have a conversation from from all perspectives, uh, calling in even competitors to um, to see if jointly you can come up with a better solution. Um, and uh, and then um, uh, that's one. And then the second thing that uh, that I I would um, think could work would be to. Um, to try to, to stay within the networks that are established, but to, to change the mindset, to change our mindsets from a, from a, um, 
sort of victimized uh, mindset to a more proactive, positive mindset um, that, um, you know, if everything has been tried, we will try something new. After all, we're in the business of creativity. Um, and um, uh, that leads me on to the third and last point of, um, of the um, administration, um, the, the, the cultural uh, administration. We are finding um, um, a lot of um, um, companies in, um, in, in the funding structures, in, uh, in permissions, in all sorts of administrative processes. And um, I think the time has come that creativity uh, enters uh, the administrative uh, rooms uh, on all levels. And um, I think that the pandemic has uh, proven that it's actually possible to move really fast uh, on administrative levels uh, when pressed hard, when you have to, when you're really pressed hard, you're pressed into a corner, you have to come up with a fast and creative solution to, to turn around, uh, be it uh, rescue packets or, or any other measures that were necessary to come up with on the spur of the moment. So I would, um, I would call on public administration on all levels to employ a lot of artists. Now there's a call. Um, let's open it to um, any of the participants. We've had a few um, comments um, in the sidebar already. Is there anyone who'd like to um, take the mic as it were? Um, just put your hand up and we'll pass the mic to you. Maria, hello, Maria Vlachu. Hello, I'll be very quick. We're starting a seminar at six and I, I need to go, but I would like to thank uh, all three panelists. Um, but particularly Milena, because she reminded us of everything we try to avoid looking at directly and everything we think has nothing to do with culture and uh, we don't, we're not in any way involved in that. Now, regarding what you said on leadership and the fact that many times directors don't have autonomy, I, I, we all know that this is the case in many contexts where there is no freedom, uh, quite authoritarian contexts. But it's not the context in all the countries. And this is what bothers me, that we have people who lead organizations, who direct organizations, and it seems that the main objective is not to be the best they can for the time they're there, but to stay there for as long as possible. So not creating, as the Portuguese say, not creating any kind of waves, to be as quiet as possible. And this is something we should not really you know, we should not comply with it. We should ask for something different. And this is, has also got to do with ethics, priorities, the way we work, what we wish to leave behind. So thank you again. Maria, thank you. Um, we had someone else. Um, was this uh, KK who wanted to say something before? All right, if you'll want to prepare them. In the meantime, um, Olga. Yeah. yeah, please. Uh, hello, 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 everybody. Hello, uh, hello. Hello. Oh, I think we have an overlap. Hello, yeah, let's let's hear from uh, KK first. Um, sure. Just a second, Olga. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one greeting to all of you. Uh, this is an opportunity in front of all of you. Actually, uh, as an independent filmmaker. Everybody has some dreams. I have also, but uh, recent uh, situation is uh, not good for all the uh, countries. Uh, those that those having some dreams. Uh, KK, uh, I'm I'm really are... sorry. We've we're having trouble with the audio. Is there a microphone that you can use that would be clearer? Or it, it's it sounds very very muffled. We can't hear you very clearly. I'm afraid. Okay. Maybe if you take the um, your computer's microphone, maybe try that. Or if you like, uh, just put put your um, question in the chat or your comment in the chat, and I'll relay it back. 
I'm afraid the audio isn't uh, isn't uh, our friend today with with the sound. Uh, can I go back to Olga? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Christoph, and thank you all the panelists. Uh, thank you for putting together all this wonderful experimental conference with speed dating and this panel that comments on the speed dating uh, uh, ideas and uh, and brings uh, brings in some new. Uh, I just wanted uh, to make a quick comment on the relevance because uh, I think that this is uh, one of the issues that we should be looking closely at when dealing with crisis in uh, in cultural sector. And uh, uh, one thing that uh, that bothers me is that cultural institutions are looking inwardly, uh, trying to solve the crisis without looking for what's relevant now and how we can be relevant still or become relevant with the changing environment. And uh, someone put a comment in the chat that uh, crises uh, change our audience's attitudes values, opinions, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, outlooks. And this is something that I would suggest cultural institutions need to do uh, alongside inward looking, look outwardly to our audiences to see how they are changing in order to be relevant uh, for them. We need to, in a way, because we are, uh, this is this is kind of a service we're doing to the community working in the cultural sector so in order to do this service to provide the service in the best of ways uh, i think that uh, we need to be able to follow our audiences as well as help them reshape um, uh, with uh, with what we're uh, doing so this is it thank you so much thank you very much olga that's um absolutely excellent um would anyone like to react to that no i would like to respond to malik question in the chat please okay because i think definitely it's not the same online festival or event or even this kind of gathering. And that is exactly that I can give on the example of my India experience. My first experience of theater happened on the Memorial Day of Saftar Hashmi, 1st of January, 2010. And that was a real life experience when you sit among audience, India audience, from noon till late in the evening on the periphery of New Delhi, and you watch theater performances changing one by another, done in honor to one killed theater practitioner leftists killed by paramilitary forces in 1989. This year, I participated in Safdar Hashmi Memorial Lecture online. I gave this lecture. I couldn't meet anyone. I couldn't discuss. I couldn't feel the audience. That's, yes, I had questions like we have now. I responded, but that's not the same experience. We need both. We need festivals in a real life format, but of course now it's better to have them online or nothing. It's also very important that we can see, that we can discuss at least through chats, through papers, through Twitters, through whatever who is using what about new production, new values, new, the artists deserve to show their works, whether it be theater, film, and so on. So I think, yes, digital platforms are necessary and useful, but they cannot and they shouldn't replace uh, real life events where we can really feel uh, this interstimulation from audiences because uh, Every cultural event is interaction is uh, interactive event, and I think this kind of uh, um, uh, how you say it? cultural hybrid model, but now, for example, for us in this moment is possible. So we have in this very moment international film festival in Belgrade that is going in vivo, but one third of seats in cinemas are, can be occupied and online 
you are buying ticket and watching from your home. So it's something in between, but possible. Right. Thank you, Milena. Um, we are coming up to the last couple of minutes that we've got. I'll um, just um, say that we've got, for those who would like to continue the conversation over a virtual beer, the real conversation over a virtual beer, um, there will be um, a link um, for a post-conference discussion where you can sit, sit yourself um, at a cocktail table with someone. Um, there will be a link or should be a link soon in the chat um, to, a, uh, to the Wonder Me platform. Uh, where you can continue the conversations and uh, ask um, some tricky questions and get some pretty good responses back. Um, do we have do we have any more questions from anyone, or would anyone like, like to make any final remarks? I just wanted to say one thing. Last is um, again the, to related to the question of ethics and values. Because I was just before that panel, I was in a, in, in, a, in a working group on um, uphold democracy and European based um, uh, and, and European values, sorry. And I was really struck that how much, um, even in a country in the Netherlands, it was a Dutch event, that uh, discussion on the role of culture and democracy and um, uh, the battle that needs to take place is kind of not happening is that we that's issues that are being silenced um both on in the political level but also on the level of the civil society that this is really the issue of values is something that uh, uh they, it's so there's so much anxiety so much so so much loaded that very um reframe from that dialogue and that conversation. And then of course, it is this void is taken up by um, more populist voices. And then I, I, it just reminded me, which is not new, but I was again struck that in a country like even in the Netherlands, where this was like really um, highlighted how much this is, this kind of conversations are really silenced at all levels of society. So just a reminder how much we still have to um, not to allow that to happen. Um, thank you, Isabel, for the, um, for the Schlusswort. Um, I think that sounds um, super fitting. Um, I'll, I'd like to thank all of the panelists um, for um, feeding the conversation, um, for playing um, with everyone. Um, this has been incredibly useful, informative. Um, I'd also like to particularly thank um, um, Elsa, Milena, um, and Isabel um, for working uh, with us today. The organizers uh, from the Compendium for European Cultural Policies, Ulrike um, Blumenreich, uh, Oliver Goebbel, the contact points for Creative Europe, Lea Strivas, Sophia Hodge, Anja Dietzmann, and for the Europe for Citizens contact point, um, Jochen Bud Um It's been quite a ride. I wish we had a lot more time actually, um, but I'll be surfing through to um, our cocktail room, our virtual cocktail room in a bit, if anyone would like to have a conversation on. Um, so thank you very much to everyone. This has been a nice Monday evening. <laughs>